we're just about to get started, so um, there's plenty of room to, to sit, so, so come up and find yourself a nice, comfortable place to sit. You can get yourself a cup of coffee, tea, there's snacks back there as well. And we're going to go ahead and get started in just a minute after everybody finds a comfortable place to sit. And there should be things on your chairs. It doesn't mean those chairs are reserved. Those are for, this is going to be a participatory event. Everybody's going to participate. So you should have paper uh, accessible to you, maybe something to write with. If you don't have something to write with, you might want to ask your neighbor. We have some extra pens to welcome. Please, if you're just coming, come on in. There's plenty of space to sit. We won't call any, we promise, if you sit in the front row. If you're in my class, I definitely will, but this is not my class, so. Come on in, welcome. We'll just give another minute for, for folks to find their way in. Welcome, come on in. How are you, Dan? Come on in, have, make yourself at home. There's plenty of places to sit. We've got chairs up front. We'll tell you all the answers to the test if you sit up front. <laughs> we'll give you all the answers. You'll get 100. All right, welcome, and thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Judy Giesberg. I'm a professor in the history department here at Villanova, and I'm really just a shepherd uh, uh, for three uh, very bright and very committed graduate students who um, have orchestrated this project over the last year um, and some change. Uh, I've been told that um, we're having a little trouble with our internet in the library, which is unfortunate because one of the things we'd like to do is show you the website that these young people have spent so, many, uh, so much time. Please come on in, we have plenty of room. You're not interrupting us at all. Come on in, there's uh, seats up here. Get yourself some coffee, tea. Um, so um, we are hoping that the internet will be working. Um, if not, we're going to think on our feet and we'll, um, we'll pull this off uh, by telling you what you can see when you go home to your homes and use your internet that works uh, to explore this website that these students have spent uh, so long working on. Um, all right, well, um, I, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Kopachewski, who's going to get us all warmed up, and then we'll, uh, we'll get going from there. But please relax, make yourselves at home. Um, if you do have something to write with, um, you might want to take it out. Um, and, and I should say, too, um, in case I forget, we passed out um, business cards with the address of the website on them. If you didn't get one of those, make sure you just touch, touch base with one of us before you leave so we can make sure we give you the website address so you can explore it yourself. Uh, with uh, more reliable internet. <laughs> All right, so um, with no further ado, let me turn it over to Jim. Okay, well, hello everyone. My name is Jim Kavachewski. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the official launch of uh, a great thing for our people, the Institute for Colored Youth, uh, Civil War Error. Uh, this project's been under development for a while now. Uh, there were many late nights, uh, more email trials than I can count, uh, and lots of caffeine. Uh, it's been an incredibly rewarding experience to work with the group here, and um, so I'd like to say thank you for coming out today and sharing the day with us. Um, we'll try to do our best to keep it light, interesting, and fun. So uh, with that said, could everyone uh, use the piece of paper they have and pen, uh, take it out, uh, because we are going to take a little bit of an exam. <laughs> Uh, so, please, uh, we'll allow you to work in groups, you can talk amongst each other, you don't really even need to write it down if you don't want the answer, but please no cell phones, iPads, abacuses, <laughs> any other sorts of implements to aid you in uh, answering these questions. So the first question is, uh, state the qualification required by the Constitution for the office of the President. You can work together. Yeah, everyone can work together. Yeah. This is collaborative. And folks out in the hallway, come on in. There's plenty of room. Professor Lucky. Professor Lucky, you can come in. Thank <laughs> you. 
already? Anyone want to answer it? Go ahead. Yeah. 35. 35 is correct. Natural, natural, natural born citizen. Correct. Okay. Anyone got the third one without looking at the board? <laughs> uh, 14 years of residence. Uh, the last part's kind of hard. Yeah, that's a little bit of a trick question. 14 years of residence yeah. in the United States. Yeah, correct. Okay, not bad. So uh, we'll go to number two, question two. This one's a little bit harder. So. Uh, could you please provi uh, provide a liberal translation of the following quote? Uh, it doesn't need to be literal. <laughs> this is the easy one. This is the easy one? <laughs> All right, well, let's see it. No pressure. Okay, you want it? Yeah, let's hear it. Oh, no, um, no, Dr. Wanda doesn't get to answer. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, 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 Professor Wanda. Yeah. <laughs> you can help others, too. <laughs> All right, would anyone like to answer this one? Is it an expert? Yeah. Is it? Buy low and sell high. Do we have any answers? Any takers? No one? <laughs> so don't be shy. All right, so I'll give it to you. This is actually uh, a quote from uh, Horace. It's Ode, Ode 16 from Book 1. And uh, I'll read it off for you, uh, the best I can. Fairer than thy mother fair, quash at thy my skirl song, burn it on thy har hearthstone there, drown it, ages waves among, Pythian priest, their frenzies lash, Dindy mean Bacchus call, Corybentine symbols clash, Moody wrath outdoes them all. All right, so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now that we warmed you up, we'll go one final question. So here we go. It's math. It's a math question. So does anyone know this one? <laughs> oh, okay. All right, well, it's no big deal because we don't know it either. So. <laughs> um, so the first question we gave you, the uh, one about the Constitution, that was from a Philadelphia public high school examination, while the final two were from the 1864 examination given to Institute graduates. Um, as you can see, uh, the Institute for Colored Youth examination uh, was a bit more rigorous uh, and was a classical education. Students were taught uh, English, Greek, Latin, algebra, geometry, tri trigonometry, history, and the physical sciences. The graduates who you will shortly meet uh, use their education to do truly extraordinary things. Whether it was through teaching, civil rights activism, or success on the baseball diamond, these graduates proved that the Institute for Colored Youth was indeed a great thing. Thanks. Well, I'm glad the test part of it was over because, and that none of you will see how I did. I do want to see what Professor, how well Professor Weiner did on that translation. We can do that afterward. Um, well, thanks, Jim, for uh, warming us up and giving us a little bit of a sense of what it, it was like to um, attend uh, this great school that laid at the heart of, of Philadelphia. Uh, for those of you who just came in, uh, my name is Judy Giesberg. I'm a professor, professor in the Department of History here at Villanova, um, and I'm going to introduce in just a moment um, uh, the three graduate students who are, um, who've done all the work uh, to research the school and to build a website that celebrates its early history. 
Um, I'll just tell you a little bit, I'll just open things up a little bit for us, and then once again, I'll turn it over um, uh, to the big brains. The Institute for Colored Youth opened um, in 1852 on 7th and Lombard Streets in Philadelphia. The school quickly gained a reputation for academic excellence and became a central part um, of the black community in the city. The school hired the brightest and the best men and women of color from the state and elsewhere in the north. The institute thrived in Philadelphia, moving to a larger location on 9th and Bainbridge Street in 1866, before moving out of town at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, that is. The Institute for Colored Youth, I don't need to tell a lot of you here, continues to exist today, uh, now known as Cheney University. <laughs> the first Institute for Colored Youth graduates became leaders in many facets of the African American community. Um, they were teachers in segregated northern schools. Others opened up schools for freed men and women in Reconstruction South. Also among their ranks were newspapermen, government employees, the second African American female doctor in the nation's history and a United States minister to Liberia. These women and men studied together at the Institute and then went on to fight for equal rights during and after the war, lobbying for and protecting suffrage for men of color, integrating the city's streetcars, and demanding equal access to schools. At the Institute, women and men were held to the same exacting intellectual standards, which was unusual at the time. Originally intended to train women and men of color in the mechanical arts, Institute teachers developed a rigorous academic curriculum that included, as you just saw, advanced mathematics, the sciences, English, philosophy, various social sciences, classical languages. To graduate in 1864, from which those last two um, exam questions, uh, they, they came from that graduation exam. To graduate in 1864, uh, students had to master a bunch of math that I don't remember at all. Maybe some of you do. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we, can, we can share notes afterward on how many of you were able to, to answer that last question. Namely, um, higher algebra, logarithms, um, geometry, and plane and spherical trigonometry. Um, English, philosophy, chemistry, Greek, and Latin, as, as Jim already said. They were expected, too, to read the New Testament in Greek. Students received religious instruction, and they were required at all times to maintain the highest standards of behavior. Finally, students had to pass rigorous oral examinations that were held before the board of managers and were open to the public. To complete the course of study at the Institute for Colored Youth, it goes without saying young women and men had to be bright and had to have nerves of steel. Although supported by a vibrant black community full of their churches, uh, schools, and benevolent institutions, Philadelphians of color faced daily reminders that the majority white population of this northern city shared the racial sentiments of the slave-owning South. Black Philadelphians were excluded from concert halls, public transportation, schools, churches, meeting halls, and other public places. And they were harassed and assaulted even in their own neighborhoods. Their churches and meeting places were attacked. Frederick Douglass believed there was not a city to be found, in his words, quote, in which prejudice against color is more rampant than in Philadelphia. Although there was nothing new about these, uh, these sentiments that I just described, young black Philadelphians who grew up in the decade before the war and during it seemed more willing to confront the prejudice head on, as Dan and Murray showed in, in, in their uh, study of that generation. In March 1860, for example, a group of young uh, activists tried to rescue a fugitive who'd been ordered to return to slavery, attacking federal marshals as they led the man to a train station. Although the attempt failed, the bold attack on federal officials signaled a new militancy among activists who were one generation removed from um, uh, the older generation, William Still and Robert Purvis. Raised in politically active households, young women and men like, like, like uh, Octavius Cato, Jacob White Jr., Carolyn LeCount, attended the Institute for Colored Youth and then became teachers, 
training a generation of young people in the classics and in resistance to prejudice. And in the process, they welcomed, in the they, they welcomed the community as a whole to visit the Institute Library, to, to attend debates and lectures, and also to come to those graduations where they could hear Carolyn LeCount get a perfect score of her translation of a section of the Iliad while standing in front of a crowd of people. A parent in the community once remarked of the Institute, you cannot think how proud I am of that institute and how grateful I am to the managers for its library, its schools, its lectures, and its colored teachers. Oh, it is a great thing for our people. And that's where we get the title of this website. This project tells the story of those teachers and their students. We'd like to extend a, a thanks to all of you for attending and to the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, the Departments of History and Africana Studies, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the digital librarians here at Falvey Library. I should also add Regina Duffy, who's standing out there nervously in the hallway hoping that the internet is fixed. Um, and particularly David Uspel, um, who's one of these digital librarians um, uh, who supported us um, throughout the building of this website. The project began as a challenge to, challenge to students in my graduate Civil War seminar last spring. Three students took me up on that challenge, and let me introduce them to introduce you to them now. And they're going to come up not all at once, but uh, one at a time. So the first student you'll hear today is Elizabeth Modich. Um, who was actually not a student at that time, but took up the challenge anyway. A little did she know um, how much work she would have to do in the next uh, year to catch up with everybody else who had already taken the class. So um, Elizabeth, thank you for your work. And then you'll hear James Kopachewski, uh, who was in that class too. I'm not sure if he volunteered or if we drafted him, uh, but he's been with the project too from the beginning. Um, and then you'll hear from uh, Michael Johnson, um, who, among many other virtues, a good historian, a good writer, um, also has a lot of digital skills that he's kept secret for a long time. So he helped us get this website working. And if it's not working today, it's not Michael's fault. It's because the website, because we're having internet troubles. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth, and then you'll hear from Jim, and then you'll hear from Mike. And as Judy has said, my name is Elizabeth Modich, and I was very, very excited to be the only first year graduate student to participate in this project. So as we mentioned previously, one of the primary purposes of the Institute for Colored Youth was to train excellent teachers. And many very good teachers certainly came out of this institution. So I want to begin by giving you a brief overview of the schools in Philadelphia that preceded the Institute for Colored Youth. So first, in 1822, we had the Mary Street School. And this was the first segregated school for black students in the city of Philadelphia. It was opened by Quakers, and namely a gentleman by the name of Roberts Vaux who was very influential in opening the Institute for Colored Youth as well. So after that, there was the Lombard Street School. And that was, again, a segregated school. White teachers taught the African-American students. And Octavius Cato was amongst the pupils of the Lombard Street School. So what I want to emphasize with these schools in the 1820s was that there were existing schools in the city of Philadelphia to educate African American students. The Institute for Colored Youth was not the first, but it was certainly one of best by 1852. In 1854, the Common School Law came into effect, which stated that all schools in Pennsylvania were to be racially segregated, in effect, separate but equal. And in 1881, the segregation law in Pennsylvania was repealed, but school segregation occurred throughout the state until the 1970s. So that's just a little background on the Institute for Colored Youth's preceding schools. But now I want to tell you about the school and about the teachers themselves. So the school opened in 1852, and the goal, as Dr. Giesberg mentioned, was to provide the best education for black students and train very good teachers. 
So the three students that I'm going to mention that I'm going to introduce you to are Sarah L. Daffin, who went by Sally in all of the records that we talk about. She graduated from the class of 1860, and she was most notable for teaching Freedmen in the South, although she, al although she also taught in New Jersey for a brief period after she graduated. James L. Smallwood graduated in the class of 1864, and he taught African American students in the North and opened the first segregated school for black students in York, Pennsylvania. Cordelia Jennings Atwell graduated in 1860, and she did a lot of things. She opened the, or uh, was a teacher at the Ohio Street School in Philadelphia. She taught freedmen in Kentucky and in Petersburg, Virginia. And then she moved north and taught students in Harlem, New York. So I'll begin with talking about Sally Daffin, who was pr pr probably one of my most favorite students to research. So Sally Daffin was very interesting because she was a very eloquent writer. She wrote a lot of columns for the Christian Recorder newspaper, and she was a sponsored missionary teacher with the American Missionary Association. And she traveled south after the Civil War to open schools for freedmen. So Sally Daffin, uh, during the Civil War, she formed an aid society in Norfolk, Virginia, and she moved on to teach freedmen in Norfolk, Virginia, Wilmington, North Carolina, and finally Clinton, Tennessee. Her most significant impact was probably on the community of Clinton uh, due to the number of reports about her moral worth and her intelligence and her eloquence and she taught a Sunday school class there in addition to providing a secular education. So the school was combined. But unfortunately, Sally Daffin's school was a victim of arson in 1869. So just before, just after this quote was written right here about her efforts, the school burned a little bit after that, about a year after that. And although the school burned, Sally persevered at that point. She went back to the north and she worked in several other schools, but it was very interesting to see the impact that she had on this community. My next teacher is James L. Smallwood. And he was another favorite of mine because he was originally from my community. I grew up in York County, Pennsylvania, and I found through the National Census Bureau and my local historical society, the Lord York Heritage Trust, that James L. Smallwood had actually opened the first segregated school in York, Pennsylvania. And he has this historical marker on the spot where the school stood. So he was a very interesting person as well because he graduated in 1864. And in addition to being a teacher, he was also a mason. He was very, uh, not a stone mason, but the, the order, and a barber. So he was someone who was very, very active in his community. And he unfortunately passed away at the age of 40 before he could see his school become particularly active. But he was, you know, memorialized on that marker. And the school became the site of very contentious arguments during the segregation years in the 1930s. A lot of people objected to the school's presence in the community. And it closed in the 1960s when school desegregation finally began to occur throughout the state of Pennsylvania. The final teacher, and certainly the one who did the most, was Cornelia A. Jennings Atwell. And she opened a school in her mother's house just after graduating where she employed Caroline LeCount and Mary V. Brown, who were two of our other graduates. Then she moved on to teach at the very prominent Ohio Street School where she was applauded for her 
moral character and her intelligence as well as her teaching skills. In 1867, Jennings moved to the South and she became principal of Freedman's School in Louisville, Kentucky. Then she moved to Petersburg, Virginia, where her husband became the first African Methodist Episcopal deacon. So that was an interesting segment in religious history as well, because her progression followed his career also. And in Virginia, Jennings said that education is a reality with the freedmen now, a fixed fact. We have no quaint or rapturous expressions of thanksgiving or wonder to narrate as when schools were first opened and we introduced books with their mysteries. Schools are a system. We have classes like those in other regular institutions. So that just goes to show the progress that many of the Institute for Colored Youths um, graduates had made in the South, as well as the other teachers in Freedmen's Bureau, that classes were now a regular thing for these children of slaves. So following that experience in Petersburg, Virginia, she opened a school in Harlem, New York, and that's where she ended up. And certainly, I just want to leave you with the fact that all of ICY students who entered teacher training became excellent teachers. And they were applauded on so many different things. We came across so many quotes about the strength of these teachers and they made a great impact on the, both the black and white citizens of the South that they were able to teach to. We could hear that as well, that there was almost this integrated movement in some of the communities where the teachers taught, despite all of the backlash and the prejudice that they endured. So that is our teachers, and now we are going to move on to civil rights activism. So. activism that uh, some of our graduates took part in. Uh, up until 1838, African-American men could vote in the state of Pennsylvania. While voting uh, was often accompanied by violence, uh, men bravely lined up in front of the Pennsylvania State House, now known as uh, Infants Hall, to cast their ballots. The success of African-Americans in uh, exercising the vote troubled many white lawmakers who, emboldened by uh, a rise in nativist rhetoric, began to systematically degrade the rights of African-Americans. Uh, by 1838, Pennsylvania lawmakers decided that the franchise would be the sole domain of white males. In adding a single word to the Pennsylvania state constitution, uh, the Pennsylvania le legislature stripped the right to vote away from over 40,000 individuals. Of course, the word that the legislature added was white. From 1838 to 1870, the Pennsylvania constitution read that the right to vote was solely for white free men of the age of 21 years. Nevertheless, graduates from the Institute uh, for Colored Youth defiantly fought disenfranchisement. When Frederick Douglass uh, established the National Human Rights League in 1874, Institute graduates quickly filled the ranks of the organization. The Pennsylvania Equal Rights League, the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Equal Rights League, uh, was comprised of numerous Institute graduates, mostly in positions of leadership. Uh, Jacob C. White, Jr., class of 1857, and Octavius E. Cato, class of 1858, served as corresponding secretaries. Uh, John Quincy Allen, class of 1862, served as a delegate from Philadelphia County. And James Fields Needham, also class of 1862, served on the executive board. In addition, Samuel G. Gould, class of 1858, served as president of the New Jersey branch of the Equal Rights League. Uh, these graduates used the Equal Rights League to advocate for desegregation of public spaces, access to quality education, and of course, voting rights. Although the League's policies were spearheaded by prominent community members like the Institute's graduates, its initiatives were supported by everyday people, many of whom donated from their weekly salaries, which was usually pretty, pretty eager. Uh, moreover, though, the Equal Rights League uh, created influential relationships with uh, Pennsylvania Congressman William D. Kelly and Thaddeus Stevens, who would help shepherd the 15th Amendment through Congress. So uh, the picture we have up on the screen here is actually uh, 
the cover of the 1866 uh, minutes from the Pennsylvania Equal Rights League. So curious. I, I believe most of these are up on the website if you want to take a closer look at them. So. Um, okay. So with a small but powerful contingent of radical Republicans in Congress, legitimate gains in civil rights legislation uh, seemed possible. Uh, Institute graduates amplified their advocacy and even published uh, numerous documents calling for universal manhood suffrage. For instance, one such publication from 1866 states, is it not our duty to ask in the name of justice, in the name of humanity, in the name of those whose bones whiten the battlefields of the South, that every bar to our political enfranchisement be now and forever removed? Do this, and all other evils and outrages will disappear as dews of morning melt before the morning sun. In 1868, the ratification of the 14th Amendment legalized all African American, uh, legalized all Afri African Americans, including recently freed, recently freed slaves, as citizens of the United States. While the 14th Amendment would only grant very limited legal protections, it made the 15th Amendment possible. Ratified uh, in February 1870, the 15th Amendment finally granted African American men the right to vote. Suffrage uh, became a unifying force within the black community as women understood the vote of their husbands, fathers, and brothers as representative of their interest. Even with achieving its primary goal of suffrage, the, the National Equal Rights League continued its work by protecting African American voters from election day violence, which in some cases was successful, and in other cases not so successful, um, and it also uh, fought to desegregate public spaces. Uh, the picture up on the screen now is a rather famous image from Harper's Weekly, uh, and the man with the nice beard, is, uh, he's, he's casting his ballot. So one such public space uh, that, that was in need of desegregation was the streetcar system, which served the city of Philadelphia uh, and its surrounding suburbs. All the city's uh, eight car companies did not allow black passengers to ride on an equal basis with whites. Uh, in many cases, uh, African Americans were forced to ride uh, in the very front of the car, as you can see, behind the horse, which for obvious reasons was rather unsavory, or, uh, or would have to wait until a segregated color car arrived. If a rider failed to follow these regulations, they were forcefully ejected from the car, meaning they were literally picked up and thrown off the car. Uh, in many cases, this, uh, caused many, uh, this caused people to sustain serious injuries. So uh, to combat this, uh, this segregation, uh, institute uh, leaders and uh, different community members decided to come up with a three-prong strategy. The first prong was implemented by William Still, who is uh, perhaps best known for his work with fugitive slaves. He, uh, he collected uh, petitions, mostly from white folks, uh, and, and sent them to streetcar companies in the hopes that they would voluntarily desegregate. Uh, since Still's efforts uh, didn't work, uh, Institute graduates decided to implement a second, uh, second prong. Led by Octavius Cotto, uh, Institute graduates lobbied Pennsylvania legislatures to, uh, to desegregate the cars. In a speech to the Union League of Philadelphia, Cato urged black men to stand up to injustice. He stated, vindicate your manhood and no longer suffer defenseless women and children to be assaulted or insulted with impunity by ruffinly conductors and drivers. Unmoved by Cato's pleas to manhood, uh, black women implemented the third and most successful prong of streetcar desegregation. Uh, Caroline McCount, uh, class of 1863, and other women decided to sit in uh, restricted areas of the cars to force conductors to determine whether or not they were going to implement company policy. Um, in almost every case, uh, the women were violently ejected. So after being ejected from the cars, the women uh, went to the court system to sue the conductors and the companies for the injuries they sustained. Eventually, uh, this, this uh, last prong worked. And uh, on March 22nd, 1867, Pennsylvania Governor John Geary signed a law banning segregation on streetcars and railroads. The law mandated uh, fines or imprisonment for conductors who denied service to African Americans. Uh, so three days later, on March 25th, 1867, when Caroline Account uh, entered a streetcar, she was denied service. She immediately walked to the nearest police officer, uh, brandished uh, a copy of the law that she had in her pocket, and the conductor was subsequently fined $100. So the picture up there is uh, that, that's what a streetcar would look like in the 19th century. It's a, I think that might be a little later in our time period, but it's a pretty accurate representation of what they looked like. Okay. So 
Despite uh, successes uh, in suffrage and streetcar street desegregation, black women had their political voices filtered through char charitable clubs and organizations. With the creation of the United States Colored Troops in 1863, black women established a ladies' union association, a charitable organization dedicated to providing supplies for black soldiers. The LUA uh, donated money, uh, uh, donated food as well, and was comprised of uh, numerous institute graduates, including Mary B. Brown, uh, who Elizabeth mentioned, and M. Gertrude Ophit. Uh, the work of these uh, wartime relief organizations uh, caught the interest of those planning the 100th anniversary uh, celebration of the United States of America. As a part of the centennial celebration of 1867, uh, the United States Centennial Commission uh, planned a giant exhibition to be held in Fairmont Park. The work of raising money to ensure that the exhibition would be a proper grandeur fell to the Women's Executive uh, Centennial Commission. Led by a Miss Mary Rose Smith, the committee was comprised of mostly wealthy white women. These women struggled to find enough donations uh, to uh, fill the coffers of the national organization. So they turned to the African American community to bolster their efforts. While uh, in theory this is a pragmatic move, Smith and the committee were not above prejudice. Uh, they mandated that black women could only enter the homes of black families and that they were strictly prohibited from entering the households of white families. Um, so when black women protested, Smith stated that the work of the centennial did not concern them, but only white people. In response to Smith's prejudice, Institute graduates Caroline LeCount and Rebecca J. Cole, as you see up there, that's Rebecca J. Cole, and I, I suggest that you look up her bio on the website, she's really did fantastic stuff. Um, they took to the newspapers to uh, condemn Smith's actions. When asked by a reporter from the, Na the New National Era if black women would continue working with the Centennial Committee, LeCount bluntly stated, I think not, sir. In fact, I feel certain that we will take no part in any commission whatever. The Women's Committee uh, quickly realized the damage that had been done by Smith's actions and called a series of meetings aimed at placating the concerns raised by Cole and LeCount. Uh, Cole accepted the apology uh, from Smith and would actually go on to work with the committee to raise funds. However, LeCount refused to accept the committee's apology as she viewed the organization as representative of the worst color prejudice. Um, so uh, what we have on the screen is actually the official program from the 1867 uh, centennial. Oh, 76, my fault, sorry. I always confuse that. Um, so, in all, whether it was through uh, membership in the Equal Rights League, uh, challenging streetcar segregation, or using newspapers to expose prejudice, Institute for Colored Youth graduates all learned one lesson incredibly well. And that lesson was to never back down from a civil rights fight. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Mike. All right, so at this point, you're probably all thinking, man, these exams and, you know, all the civil rights legislation and teaching, did these people ever have any fun? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the Pythian Baseball Club of Philadelphia. As many of you might know, over the course of the 19th century, baseball was quickly growing in popularity in Philadelphia and in cities all over the United States. But like many aspects of society, the game was segregated. So left off of the white teams that were forming, African-American men started forming their own clubs. Led by Octavius Cato and Jacob C. White, both graduates of the Institute for Colored Youth, young African-American men formed the Pythian Baseball Club of Philadelphia in 1866. Right. Just, does anybody know what Pythian means? Actually, I just noticed it. It was in the exam. It's a reference to the precursor to the ancient games, uh, in the, uh, the Olympic Games in ancient Greece. So just from that alone, you know these players were no slouches. <laughs> So the members of the Pythian Club represented the intellectual elites of Philadelphia's African-American community. Going off the 1868 roster, you can see several graduates of the Institute for Colored Youth. And the team was broken up into nines. So the first nine, which would be the starting nine, had captain, the captain and second baseman, Octavius Cato, as well as Frank J.R. Jones. The second nine had Raymond Burr and Andrew Jones. The third nine had William Jones, Henry Boyer, and Jacob White, who also served as scorekeeper, secretary, and statistician. <laughs> and then the fourth nine had Jacob's brothers, Joseph and Martin White. 
Uh, just as an aside, because I, I had to share this. Uh, after 1868, uh, Henry Porter quit the team, and, and according to the records, he quit because he was a muffin. And you know, we thought, all right, it's, you know, he's a bum, he must stink. Well, we came across in 1868 official guide to baseball, and muffin is a technical term. It is a class of ball players who are practically and theoretically unacquainted with the game. Some muffins, however, know something about how the game should be played, but cannot practically exemplify their theory. <laughs> muffins rank the lowest in the grade of nines of a club, the list including first and second nine players, amateurs, and lastly, muffins. <laughs> so next time you're, you want to impress your friends, you're watching a ball game, don't call the guy a bum. Call a muffin. <laughs> so the, the Parthians, they kind of got off to a slow start. They played one game in 1866. They played the Albany Bachelor, and they got crushed 70 to 15. But after that loss, they quickly became one of the area's premier African-American baseball teams. In 1867, they went 9-1, and one, losing their only game to the Washington Mutuals, 44 to 43. The following year, which you can see, this is their 1868 schedule, they went 6-0-1. Oh, uh, it's a little bit hard to read, but I'll just go through their schedule. They played the Camden Blue Sky, beating them 26-12. They played the Active of Westchester, beating them 31-9. They tied, they played the Active of Westchester again, tied them 30-30. to Then they played the Mutual of Washington, and won 49-33. They played the Alert of Washington, 40-34. They beat the Brooklyn Monitor, 27-9. And then they beat the Harrisburg Monrovia, 71-16. So I, I read the other day that the new commissioner of baseball is trying to improve offense. Um, I, I think you should look to the past. <laughs> but despite their, their skill on the field, uh, baseball was much more than a game for Cato and the other graduates of the Institute for Colored Youth. It also served as an opportunity to push for equality in post-war society. In October of 1867, the Pythians applied for membership to the Pennsylvania chapter of the National Amateur Association of Baseball Players. They sent Institute graduate Raymond J. Burr to the convention in Harrisburg to, rep to re represent their application. In Harrisburg, Burr reported on the congeniality and support for many of the convention members especially from the men of the Philadelphia Athletics, a white team with which, with which the Pythians had friendly relations. Burr reported on how men would invite him to dinner and even to a local baseball game. But things changed when it came time to vote on Pythian membership to the league. After the vote was delayed once, many members approached Burr telling him that regardless of their personal sympathies, they could not vote against the opinions of the clubs they represented. On the advice of his supporters, Burr ultimately withdrew the application to keep the Pythians from being blackballed from future membership. Despite individual support among some of the delegates, the decision from the convention was clear. There was no place for the African-American members of the Pythians among the white teams of Pennsylvania. Unsurprisingly, this did not stop the Pythians from demanding equality. A few months later, they applied for membership to the National Convention of Baseball Clubs, which was conveniently meeting in Philadelphia. But this time, while the result was the same, uh, the Pythians were not treated with the same respect that they received in Harrisburg. When it came time to a vote, the, the, the convention flat out denied them, declaring that any club which may be composed of one or more colored persons would not be invited to join the convention the set a color line precedent that would last for decades. Now, despite their rejections by the state and national conventions, the Philadelphia community could not ignore the success of the Pythians on the field. Many began wondering how the Pythians would fare against some of the city's white teams. It was not long before demands, uh, before demands started appearing in newspapers for the in for first interracial game to take place. So in 1869, the Pythians issued a challenge to several white teams in the city. But the white teams were reluctant. Of course, taking the field against an African-American team would admit their equality. And what if they lost? Eventually, the Olympic Baseball Club, which principally is the first, uh, the first club to form in the city, 
accepted the challenge and scheduled a game for Friday, September 3rd. Before one of the largest crowds to date for a baseball game, the Pythians took an early lead in the first inning. But they were playing at a disadvantage. According to the rules at the time, since there was only one umpire on the field, players were allowed to challenge calls. <laughs> you can see how that could be controversial. And of course, being an African American team, they didn't want to appear to challenge their white counterparts. So before the game, they had agreed not to challenge any calls on the field. Ultimately, the Pythians fell to the Olympics 44 to, to 23. But their play impressed the spectators, influencing a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer to comment that the Pythian players, quote, acquitted themselves in a very creditable manner, especially their outfielders, who made, very, who made several very fine fly catches. Stories of this novel game like this article you see here, started appearing in uh, newspapers across the country. And the game was important in another way. It set an, an important precedent for interracial games. While, while uh, African American players weren't invited to play on white teams, interracial games soon became a regular occurrence in Philadelphia as in other cities. Now as many of you know, the, the color line in baseball would last until 18, or 1947 when it was broken by Jackie Robinson, who coincidentally was a second baseman just like Octavius Cato. But the pioneers of integration, men like Cato and Jacob White, proved that in the, in the 1860s, baseball could be politics by just another means. All right, so with that, uh, Assuming the internet works, I uh, will take you through a quick tour of the site, and then we'll open the floor to questions and, and hopefully uh, have a discussion. So the site uh, is called A Great Thing for Our People, inspired by the quote that Dr. Giesberg read. Uh, when you get to the site, okay. <laughs> You get this site, so we have a little introduction page which also has comments. And uh, I, I would encourage you to go on the site, comment. Uh, we're, we really hope that this project is going to be ongoing. Uh, we hope that people have suggestions or ideas of new places to look. Obviously, primary sources are a huge challenge for a project like this. And there's no doubt in my mind that there are treasure choices of sources sitting in a basement somewhere that eventually somebody is going to find. Along the top here, we have a navigation bar to go to the different uh, pages. So there's an about page, which gives the background of the project and, and thanks to the many people who helped us along the way. We also put together a, a brief history of the Institute for Colored Youth. Uh, the Institute for Colored Youth, um, just to clarify, you know, Cheney, they have their, their date of, of creation is 1837. That was the year that the Board of Managers formed. And then they started a school where they focused on agricultural and mechanical uh, instruction. It wasn't in 1852, that's the date that they moved to Lombard Street and opened what became the Institute for Colored Youth. The crux of the project are the biographies of the first 37 graduates between 1856 uh, and 1864. Now, when we, we really debated this throughout how we were going to present this, and we ultimately wanted to go with something that was somewhat rep uh, reminiscent of a yearbook. Obviously, as you can see, that was a huge challenge because despite the incredible things that these men and women did, we have no pictures of them. Uh, we have a few, but for the most part, we were forced to use silhouettes. And I kind of think that that offers a powerful message of how much they're still left to learn. Uh, we know how much these, these uh, men and women did, and we're just breaking the surface, but they're still a silhouette to us because we don't know what they look like and, and there's so much, so much more we have to learn. Uh, we put together a brief page on the faculty. Oh, sure. Uh, so each of these pictures is, you click on it and then we provided a, a biography of each of the graduates. Uh, some are more extensive than others. Some. Uh, uh, William Jones and Andrew Jones, those names are so incredibly common, uh, speaking saying from Michael Johnson. But uh, 
Um, but, it, you know, we did the best we could with some of those names. Uh, Jesse Glasgow, for example, he was the first graduate. Uh, he was considered, he was off the charts intelligent, and after graduating, he went over to the University of Edinburgh, where he continued to excel. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, just shy of graduating due to illness. We put together a, a, sh a page on the faculty. We didn't do biographies uh, for the faculty because we wanted to focus on the students, but you can see the teachers. And as you go along, the names start to get familiar because the institute starts gra uh, hiring their own graduates. You can see Cato, Martha Farbo, and the, you know, these men and women who keep coming back. You know, as we studied these students, we also noticed that they can, you know, not only are they a community in the school, but as you saw, they're a community outside. So we, we had to put together a, a group of moments. And as you see, there's some of the things that we talked about today, but these are moments uh, during and after the Civil War where these men and women came together as a community and really led the African American community in things like being teachers, the Pythians, uh, uh, enlistment drives, women's relief, and things like that. You can click on each of these and t a story will pop up telling the story of this moment. Uh, we also put together uh, a list of documents which you can click on and explore. Uh, you'll have all the, grad the, uh, the graduation ceremonies as well as the exams in case you want to really go back and feel bad about your own education. <laughs> <laughs> um, then there's a list of, of letters and speeches uh, and various things. A lot of this came from the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Uh, we really had a great opportunity to work with them and they helped us digitize uh, much of their collection and, and use on our own website. And then we also uh, tried a couple things to put the Institute for Colored Youth in the context of you know, United States history and Philadelphia history. So we put together a timeline of important events uh, starting with Richard Humphreys uh, passing away and leaving the initial uh, funds for the school and going all the way uh, through the Civil War era and I think it ends with uh, the assassination of Octavius Cato in 1871. Uh, so we have important things that went on in the school and then also things that went on in the United States, the fall of Fort Sumter, John Brown's raid, uh, and things like that. And then the last thing is we put together a map of the institute community. Uh, so this is the, the first section is like a, a sort of an interactive map, which has points of, if we could find it, where the graduates lived, as well as important things, uh, important landmarks in the community. And you can click on each of these. So this is uh, 822 South Street. This is the actual spot where Octavius Cato was murdered in 1871. You know, 904 Robin Street, this was the home of Carolyn McCount and her family uh, in the year that they graduated. And then below the interactive map, we have a, this is a static map of, of the Seventh Ward, which is the, the historic ward that W.D.B. Du Bois studied, uh, the part, uh, historically African-American uh, community, and it has all these landmarks. And this is a map from 1865, so it gives you an idea of, of what was going on in that community. And then we have several landmarks marked on that map uh, for you to explore. Uh, so that's a, a quick rundown of the site. Uh, now we would love to open the floor to questions and comments. Yeah, in the back. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you. I think this was a great job and a very important job, so I really appreciate that. The second thing I wanted to mention, I'm so glad you pointed out the 1837 versus 1852 because a lot of Cheney grads were really panicky about that. Like, <coughs> I thought these were scholars at Villanova. How did they get the date wrong? But, um, thank you for um, clarifying that. My important question is, it started off as the African Institute, but that only lasted for a short period of time. Can you explain... Uh, how it got that name and why it lasted for such a short period of time. Well, when Richard Humphreys, who was the, the Quaker who left the, the original fund for the school, uh, in his will, he leaves $10,000 to a group of men, and he basically says this money is to be used for the education of African Americans in 
either agricultural or mechanical or scholarly education, as well as the, the training of teachers. So he really left it up to the men that he left the money to, to decide what they were going to do with it. Uh, at first, they thought that agricultural or mechanical training would best suit African American children. So they start with, the, they buy a farm and, and they invite these, the, a couple uh, students to come work on the farm. They also get them uh, apprenticeships in different trades. Uh, and then after several years, it's not working out like they, that they were hoping. They didn't have quite the support that they wanted. They didn't have as many students as they thought that they could reach. And that's when they look, they go back to Humphrey's original call and they say, all right, well, let's focus on creating teachers. Maybe this will, will help the African American community more. And so in 1852, that's when they opened the Institute for Colored Youth. And, and that really takes off. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add, they also couldn't find white tradesmen who would hire the young black. Apartment. Exactly, yeah, that was an issue as well. When Richard Humphrey gave the $10,000, didn't they open it in Willow Grove first? Wasn't that where the farm was? They had a manual arts school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was that side. It wasn't in the city. Yeah, it was in Willow Grove. Okay, yeah. Thank you. was finishing up the Emily Davis project and she presented it at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and, and people were getting up just as you did and said, uh, you know, uh, my grandmother lived in the community then and this is what our family story was. And it just fascinates me that these stories get passed down and, and survive. And, and, and uh, in, in Biddle and Dubin's wonderful book on Octavius Cato, they mentioned they, they interview a woman who knew Pat <laughs> They I mean they interview a woman who knew Carolyn McCown, because Carolyn McCown lived until the nineteen twenties. And just that sense of continuity is just fascinating. We actually also talked to two descendants of the Cato family yes. who told us that they learned as children that their name was like a cat's toe. <laughs> How did um, the students pay for the tuition? Were there scholarships? Were they all from wealthy families? So originally, when the school first opened, they experimented with a modest tuition. Uh, the number escapes me, but at, before the first year was even out, they they decided against that and actually returned whatever money they had collected. Uh, later on, at, at, once they moved to the new building, they experiment again with a modest tuition and then again, they decide against it. Uh, the money comes primarily from Quakers. Uh, so when, when in 1866, when they moved, moved to a new building, that was after a substantial fundraising drive among the, the Quaker community where they just solicited donations. Dalton for a second, I uh, I think I saw an ancestor of mine. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we have one. Let's see. Portrait. I think I think it. Oh, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, we're getting the. Uh, we're trying. <laughs> we're getting the warning sign. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you call first name? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What's your first name? John. John. John Wesley Cromwell. Wesley Cromwell. Is that right? I know his granddaughter, Adelaide, right? Yeah, yeah she's up in Boston? Yeah, she's my friend. Oh, wow. It's, it's yeah. Boston. Yeah. Wow. Did you get my iPad? That's 
<laughs> yeah, that's like. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it really, it started, um, and they can say how they got into it, but in my case, when I first started at Villanova, I was Dr. Giesberg's graduate assistant, and uh, she was just finishing up the Emily Davis Project, and in the Emily Davis Project, the Institute for Colored Youth comes up uh, a number of times. Uh, Emily Davis was, uh, I should probably let her answer, but I'll <laughs> give, do my best. Uh, she was an African American uh, girl living in Philadelphia during the Civil War, and uh, she, she uh, left a diary uh, that was recently discovered. Um, she, was a, she was a student at the Institute for Colored Youth, uh, and also you know, uh, worked in several houses. Uh, she, did, she, doesn't, she doesn't graduate, so she's not up here on our list of people. Most people don't graduate. There we go. It's very it's high tech to the way of doing things. That's what I would have done that myself. And then if you can speak into the microphone, Just, the people in the back. Yes, I will. Sorry. So um, the, I think what we were talking about was who is Emily Davis. Uh, she was a young woman in her early 20s who lived in Philadelphia during the Civil War, uh, whose diary, uh, another group of intrepid graduate students and I were working on for a couple of years transcribing um, and annotating, and in that diary, um, she of course mentions many uh, Philadelphia institutions that she's part of, churches that she attends, lectures that she goes to, other events that she's part of, uh, but she's a student at the Institute for Colored Youth, um, and, and it's an important part of her life. Uh, we, um, at, from that point, you know, we, I had identified that I was really curious about, about the hi what histories there were of, uh, of the early, sort of Cheney's early years. Um, and I found um, that there are very, sort of, there are nice overviews of the school, um, but what was most interesting to me were these extraordinary graduates. Um, there's a, um, a report issued by the Board of Managers in, um, in 1866 listing the first 37 graduates uh, from the Institute. Um, and so I took it to my grad, I think the question was, I forgot what the question was. I'll just stop talking in a minute. But, um, I took it to the students and I took it to my students and said, wouldn't it be extraordinary if we could find out more about these young people and what they did? And, and we might learn something new about the Civil War in doing so and the post-war era. So the students all took two or three students. Some of them did great with it. Others of them said, no way, there's nothing out there. We can't find anything about these people. They disappear from the records. Um, and then and these three uh, uh, students here decided that they really wanted to find, they really wanted to tell the history of the school uh, from the perspective of the people who attended it and then went on to do extraordinary things. So that's how the, um, the project began. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Judy, isn't there a page for the Emily Davis diaries too? Uh, if we can get there, right. yeah. if, there if we have an internet. Know that, so they can yes, there is also. I'm, I'm guessing we probably don't have yeah, internet. Yeah. Uh, but you can also, it's uh, the Davis Diaries at Villanova.edu is that address if you ever wanted to look at it. But we also have passed out um, uh, nice business cards here where you can, you can go uh, to our website to, to explore the history of this um, extraordinary school. <coughs> Yes, folks, I have to bear the name of Frederick Douglass Gage. I have not been on this university since, since 1951, when I was visiting one of the stellar students, his former Chief Justice Robert N. C. Nix. He was a student here. 
before he went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And also, I wanted to mention on C-SPAN this month, in fact, they've had the presidents of Howard University and Hampton University last week. The president of this university was on this morning, and uh, going to the 20th, I think, they're going to interview six more presidents of historically black college. And of course, I work with a lot of students over the years, and I try to encourage them to pick the best school to go to, but I had a tremendous relationship with one of the former presidents of Chain University, his name was Fred Duffer, <coughs> and he was one of my newspaper customers. <laughs> and he asked me one day, did I know who Fred Douglas was. And I told him that he had a history of trying to work with Abraham Lincoln. And he said, if that's all you know about Frederick Douglass, you want to collect for these 10 newspapers that I buy from you every week in my set. You better go to the library. <laughs> so I delivered the papers on Wednesday and went to the library in Nice Town Thursday. Friday, and I came to collect for my newspapers on Saturday. Well, he called his wife out of the kitchen, called me into the living room, and he said, Frederick Douglass Gaines is going to tell us about Frederick Douglass. <laughs> <laughs> so he paid me for all my newspapers. I served the Afro-American, the Pittsburgh Courier, and the Philadelphia Tribune in the evening, and then an inquire and a record in the morning. So he paid me for all my newspapers, gave me a $10 tip. Wow. <laughs> Back in those days, that was like giving you a couple of hundred dollars. <laughs> so try to catch some of these presidents for the HBCUs on C-SPAN and uh, if you want to know the dates and stuff like that, I'll send you an email. <laughs> you're doing your email. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned did um, boys and girls attend classes together, or was it separate? And like, what was the age range of the students? And was there an entrance exam, or it was just like, if you think you can do it, you know, and you. So, uh, there were separate schools for, for girls and boys. Uh, there was also a, a, school, like a preparatory school, a lower level school for younger children. Uh, I'm not sure about an exam to enter. I don't think they were. To enter? And, and, and women went to the same exam. Yeah, they took yeah. the same yeah. exam. Yeah. 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 At the lower school, they, were, it seemed, they had younger, it seemed like they had separate schools for the younger. Yeah, yes, yes. We, we, we've been able to, we've been, this is the biggest history. We found very little, um, uh, very few sources that can tell us what happens in the classrooms, which is what we uh, set out to do. We wanted to find out what they were learning um, and how they were learning together. We, we can get their exams. Uh, we know who they are because we can find them in the census and maybe we can find them in the newspapers, but if we can't get into the classroom. We haven't been able to get into the classroom with them. Um, so, so that's a big mystery. We don't, we don't know that. We do know that they're competing against each other at graduation. That boys and girls are competing against each other mm -hmm. at graduation, and, and the girls are winning, winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a surprise. <laughs> uh, but I mean, but it, it's a surprise to see them attend, you know, at, at least at that level. Taking, I mean, they've obviously taken the same course of study, and we know for sure they were separated as well. They had separate schools at a younger age, but um, but the result is, I mean, we, we know that at some point they're they're taking the same course. <coughs> Yeah. I, um, I appreciate the work you've done, and I have I have difficulty in um, making a question. So one thing I'm interested in is, is what you got from this. Just yeah. what, just the what how did learning about these individuals at that point in time um, relate to your personal experience as you went through that development? 
the other thing that I'm kind of interested in, especially with the people like rights lead, is the political relationship us organizing in an environment when you were not really supposed to organize or you had the conflict. How did you see that? For those individuals, uh, Octavius Cotto, being able to be, you know, behead him and Jacob White Jr. of this political organization. And the third thing, I guess, is the point of, and I do have more, but the point of the females' support in that whole, because you see the strategy tactic in the end, in the 1800s, comes out to be the same tactic in the 19th, 20th century, yeah, right? Exactly. In the end, it's the same thing, yeah. a 100 year arc, and it's the yeah. same process. So you see in this, how does it impact your mm -hmm. intellectual and in development of this project? Mm -hmm. Um, we'll start, and then I mean, in, in uh, terms of what I learned, is, is really the. the um, okay. Oh, um, okay. I may not stay up. If anybody has an iPhone, they can turn it into a mobile hotspot and keep it running, but just let me know. <laughs> do that if someone has their own iPhone. I mean, I would just say, from, from my experience, the power of community. Uh, I mean, from doing this research, you see the same names coming up in the same schools and then in the same churches and then in the same political organizations and on the same baseball team. And then you know, in the same regiment when they when they join the war, um, and this interconnectivity, uh, which makes it so you know so incredible that they stayed together and then the things that they were able to do because they knew each other so well and they were all ran in the same circles. Yeah. And and for me, sir, I would say it was definitely the presence that women had in the community. I'm primarily a women's historian, and it was it was amazing to see how utterly empowered women were in this setting at that time. Um, and I did, you know, a lot of research on the female graduates and also the page on relief and the Ladies' Union Association. It was just amazing to see how they were very active in church communities and in networking and in organizing and all of the civil rights initiatives that we talked about and that you brought up here. And it was, it was just amazing to see how interconnected all of that was and how they formed a unique support system amongst themselves. Yeah, I, I think Mike was with the right on. This is a very uh, tight-knit group, and no matter what organization or club or activist movement, whatever it was, they're all together and they're all fighting for the same things. And I think uh, the map really shows you how, how closely they live together and really shows you that uh, the, the community. I think, I think so. I would suggest everyone look at the map to see how closely intertwined all these people were. And then I guess I guess I would just add to that. I mean, we, we, it's it, what we were hoping to find is you know um, a smoking gun. I mean, a meeting they had at the school in which they said, "Let's do this or let's do that." And we couldn't find. I mean, there's not. We can't find. We can't find that um, uh, right. But we know. I mean, so 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 we don't know that they're sitting around in the classroom saying, "Let's talk about nonviolent resistance" or "Let's talk about how we're going to go about attacking the streetcar issue or this voting issue." We can't find any of that because we don't. Again, we don't know what's going on in the classroom. But we do know they're all in the classrooms together, and we know that when they leave the classroom, they're going off to a meeting at a church, or um, uh, you know, or they're singing in a choir and they're at somebody's house. And so they're so it's the time they're spending together um, uh, that you know that you know that obviously they're talking about these issues, and we know they're planning these you know these um, these different campaigns. So I don't know if that answered sort of that answer. Yeah, yeah, so I, I can go, I, because the other thing I'm interested in is the intellectual warfare. Yeah. Because in that time period, the whole question of African identity is being challenged as intellectual Greek, Latin, um, using the Bible, then using the scientific literature. And here are these young people who are being versed in it. And not, you know, so I'm trying, I'm also trying to see what have you discovered, uncovered in relationship to not just if they're personal documents, because I've seen it was an attack against that, 
for any related things that gives an idea of how they were formulating their worldview, because that's the second generation, maybe the third generation of Africans that creates this institute. Yeah. At that point, they're not like first generation individuals. You know, um, those people started in churches. Right. And, 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 and among the graduates that you'll see on the website is um, our you know kind of early or early Pan Africanist. Um, there's a, there's a way in which this education sends them off in lots of different directions, sort of you know working for integration within the country, but also sort of um, uh, shepherding or imagining a better life somewhere else, leading contingents of people outside of this country to find to find a better life. So I I, I don't know I don't I I can't answer your question because I don't know. Again, what they're learning in their classrooms, but I can see the uh, what what they do with it. But we can see what they what they've done with it. Uh, should we hope to keep figuring more of that out? So, thanks, Kate. Yeah. Are you familiar with the book The Rains by Suleiman Clark? That has a lot of history about Jamie and it. He actually um, was given archives that were thrown into the trash. The rains are a I N S. Suleiman Clark. That's terrific. Thank you. This is the kind of stuff we. Was Was there any indication? You said at the very beginning, and and, and I, I I read in the history, the managers decided what the students would be taught. From that teaching, this activism came about. Was there any? direct attempt to create activists as teachers? I mean, it, it seems like, you know, I, I can only think and imagine that you, they should have been taught, you know, teach A, B, C, D, E, F, G, um, and, and let it alone. But they were, seemingly they were taught a lot more that, that, that is, We, you know, I don't think we've found direct sources that, that correlate with that, but certainly, you know, Octavius Cato, or Cato, excuse me, <laughs> mentioned so much of, in his speeches about black education by black educators. That was such a core of his beliefs and, and his activism. So certainly, you know, putting two and two together and having one of these first schools that was a proponent of black education by black educators, it, it sort of, you know, equals out, but we, you know, we haven't directly found anything that indicates that they were doing activism, the teaching activism in the curriculum. Oh, yeah. I think, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think part of it is just this learning by example. Um, in the school, uh, the, the principal, Ebenezer Bassett, uh, and then Jacob White, when he's a teacher there, and, and Cato, when he's a teacher there, you know, they're at the forefront of these recruiting drives and of these voting drives. Right. And I think that's the students are recognizing that, you know, inside and outside the classroom, you know, they're seeing what their teachers are doing. As far as the Quakers go, um, that's something that it, it's frustrating. I, I went through their minutes and I was again looking for that smoking gun. I was looking yeah. for them to say, you know, we want them to be activists. Uh, and the, the biggest thing I could find was them saying, you know, we hope that through education, these, these African-American men and women will demonstrate that they deserve to be treated as equals. Um, they, uh, nowhere did I find them saying or condemning this activism, but I, I didn't see them you know, saying from out of the activism. But he did, but he did, Mike did find that the board managers suggesting that they read, right as the war began, that they read a, a Quaker text on pacifism. Um, yes. It was an interesting moment in which they clearly are trying to influence the curriculum uh, at that critical moment when everybody in the school, like everybody else in the city and throughout the North, has war fever. They want to go and fight, fight in the war, and the Quakers are survived. We don't know whether they call it or not, but the, uh, but the board manager said it's time for them to read this book on pacifism. And of course, um, right, the students from the Institute for yeah. Youth will line up to your list. But just the yeah. comment, yeah. Um, five, Philadelphia yeah. was a hub for the Underground Railroad. Sure. Just because 
response to your question. When John Brown is captured, among the things in his pocket are the name of Ebenezer Bassett, who was one of the leaders of the school, and his address, which was the school. So Ebenezer Bassett, for a very short time, was looked at as someone who may have been aligned yes. with John Brown, and that was never proven. Probably was. Did he become the best ambassador to Haiti? He certainly did. Mm -hmm. Do you have some other questions? Well, let me just say there are lots of snacks. We can uh, stay around for uh, more questions, more conversation. Uh, thank you for coming again. And please explore the site and give us some more suggestions, more recommendations. We have people gentlemen in the back. I do want to uh, just say how much I commend you, Jenny, and the work that you gave your students. And the work that all three of you did. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. And the work that all the students did on the project. <laughs> uh, and, and I know that you're going to grad school in Washington. The best to you and continue doing this research, I hope. Is that what you plan to do? <laughs> Michael? Sleep somewhere? <laughs> somewhere. Okay. Not telling you and I know the young lady, you'll be back. So I hope you'll continue to, to do this work here. And I'm not sure what you're doing next. What are you going to do? <laughs> you know, hopefully, you'll be back and continue this work. And I hope that uh, Cheney will also embrace this as well. And we'll be working on some projects with you to continue this work going. Thank you. Thank you so much.